All right, if you have your Bibles, then we ask you to turn to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 4, beginning in verse 29. The Bible says, But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart, and with all thy soul. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shall be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget, the, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he sware unto them. For ask, how, for ask now of the days that are past, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven unto the other, whether there had been any such thing as the as great thing is, or hath been heard like it. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as thou hast heard and live? Or have God swayed to go and take a, him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all the Lord God did for us, did for you in Egypt before your eyes, unto thee it was shewed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else besides him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your honor. We thank you for the people that are here but tonight, Lord, because we understand they're here because you placed them here, uh, not by accident or mishap, but, Lord, that you brought them here by your own grace and mercy. We pray that we'd ever be thankful for that. Lord, we praise you for the word as it lies here before us, Lord, that tonight that you would uh, wake us up with your spirit and that you'd make this word a living word into our lives again, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. All right, we'll be preaching this evening, the Lord being our helper, uh, in finding the person of God. Now, um, uh, finding the person, finding the will, find, finding where you're supposed to be in the plan of the Almighty for your life. Now, very frequently, we kind of skip over that, uh, being uh, sovereign grace people. We kind of hinge on sovereignty and, and, and sometimes neglect what is the responsibility of man. Uh, because, you know, uh, uh, grace can't be true if man is not, is not intrinsically responsible for himself. And, and, and we find here that uh, as uh, Moses is writing his final address, he predicts a time uh, when God's people would depart from the Jewish faith. They would uh, he predicts a time where they would depart from the Lord God, and it is manifested in the days of Ezekiel and in Jeremiah, and, and, and the nation of Israel ceases to exist. Now, with that prediction coming, I'm going to point out a few things here in verse 29. He says, but if from thence, now, uh, excuse me, but if from thence, uh, now what he's talking about is this, um, this departure, this isolation, th this, uh, this set apart from the Lord God Almighty, uh, and the Lord God leaving them as a people. And he reminds his people when this occurs, at the moment, if it, when this occurs, but if thou from thence shalt seek the Lord thy God. Now, I want you to notice two things. Is first of all, in your worst situation, you can seek God. In your absolute worst, most difficult problem, you can seek God. Uh, when you're as far as you can be from the Lord God Almighty, 
you can still seek Him. That's the precious truth. And if you will find in chapter 3 and all up to here in chapter 4, He predicts the idolatry that they would get into where they would lose their focus on the Lord God Almighty and, and begin to focus on religion itself. It says, in the middle of that, if you'll seek Him, uh, there is never a reason we can't seek God. <coughs> now we will use a lot of an excuse, a lot of excuses, but there's never a reason that we can't seek God. So, uh, back in our text in verse twenty-nine of Deuteronomy four, he says, "Going on, thou shalt find Him." That's a promise. If you seek Him, you'll find Him. If you look for Him, you know what really conjures up. The desire for God is God Himself. Uh, you can't conjure that up in and within yourself. That itself comes from God. Now, only you know where you're at this evening. Only you can say, this is where I'm at. But are you in the will of God? Are you in a situation that you can seek God? Now, sadly, the, the large majority of us seek God when we quote unquote need him. Well, uh, news to you, you need him every day, every hour, every minute, all the time is when you need God. And, and so if that is your if that is your threshold, you might as well cross the threshold, you're here. You need God. You need him in every way possible, all the time. And so we find as Moses is writing this. In other words, don't use an excuse. If you seek Him, He's there. If you look for Him, He's present. If thou shalt seek Him with all thy heart. Now, that's kind of a hinder because most of the time we do not. We seek Him partially. When, and it doesn't mean this pumping chain chamber here, and, and, because, and it doesn't mean the inward man, the, the inner soul either, because it says seek him with your heart and soul. It means seek him with everything that you got, with your mind, your body. Get down to the house of God. Get in that book. Read the scriptures. Seek him with everything you have. That's your heart. And then seek him with your soul. That's through prayer. Uh, <laughs> And you know, a lot of times we don't do this unless there's a big decision to be made. That, that's not the way to carry this out. Seek Him every day, all the time, with everything that you have. That, that is what we're called to do. And, and the nation of Israel, if they had followed this policy, um, would have never gotten the shape they did anyway. But even before all those things that were predicted happened, He says at any time... You can seek the Lord. That's a wonderful thing, is it not? Right. At any time, no matter what our situation is, we can seek the Lord, and it will be better. It will be good. Verse 30. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou shalt turn to the Lord thy God, and shalt be obedient unto his voice. Now, again, he says there's going to be tribulations about you. There's going to be things going on, but turn unto the Lord. Now, we've arrived in a day today where there's everything going on around us except focusing on the person of the Lord. That's why so much is constantly going on. That's why the news feed is like it is. Both Fox News and CNN, they're all the same brand. What they want, you to, what they want to do is keep your eye off God. If they can keep you, you know, uh, uh, same way with regular TV, and I, I'm about as bad as anybody else. Uh, if you sit there and look at something that, you know, has really nothing to do to glorify God, and all it is is some kind of drama to, to, to make us think something's going on, then, you know, you're wasting time. Time that could be used to seek the Lord. Time that could be used to get into the Word of God. Those are wasted hours. And so, uh, Moses said, use everything you've got to seek the Lord. Everything you've got, and He'll come to you. 
Verse 31, he describes the character of God. For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee. You know, what wonderful, wonderful promise in the most difficult situation that you've ever been through. He will not forsake thee. He won't leave you. He's right there with you. He will abide with you. And he will be close unto you no matter what. Uh, you know, that's a promise for the redeemed. Now, he's writing here to the nation of Israel, but it's very applicable to the redeemed. Uh, now, sometimes you may forsake him, but he'll never forsake you. Uh, you, you may get yourself in a mess and, yeah. and distance from God, but it doesn't work the other way around. And, and so we find... That Moses gives them strong advice and he gives them good counsel for when they will get in this situation because he knew they would get in that situation. This is how you handle it. Uh, verse 32. For now, for ask now of the days that are, pa are past, which were, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven unto the other whether there be any whether there have been any such thing as this great thing is, or have been heard like it. In other words, has there been ever since a, a, a people like the people of Israel? Has there been, ever been a, a time when God down God came down and literally created a people to his own glory and his own honor and made it just for himself. That's what Israel was about, to bring glory and honor to the Lord God, Jehovah himself. And he says, has there ever been such a time? You know what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's always been that way. It always will be that way. And here in the church age, God's elect of the Gentile, we're supposed to be the very same way. We're supposed to follow him, work his glory, work his honor, and we are to seek him. And, and, and you, can, you, you, can, you can only answer this for yourself. What have you done to seek him this week? I guarantee you, if you're like me, there's more things to take your focus from him than to put your focus on him. Uh, that interferes with seeking, does it not? Now, as my years turn by, I'll be looking for something, and I'll go into the room where I think it is, and when I get there, I forgot what I was looking for to start. And that's not very effective seeking, is it? But I, I feel like our quality of seeking today is about like that, don't you? Uh, just kind of going through the motion. What about when you come down to the house of God? How much preparation, that preparatory work we talked about, uh, how much have you done before you get here? Uh, prayer. If you want to seek the Lord God, then we have to be prayerful, do we not? We have to be in that book. We have to be uh, meditating on what God might do. We are to seek the Lord, and it is the most difficult thing on this flesh that you that you will that you will walk through in this lifetime is seeking the Lord. Uh, I want to go now to First Chronicles. First Chronicles. First Chronicles, chapter twenty-two. And we're just going to notice a few things here. Uh, Addressed to the nation of Israel, First uh, Corinthians twenty-two, and we're going to read verse nineteen. First Chronicles twenty-two and verse nineteen. The Bible says this, and he was addressing some. Uh, uh, they were. Um, it was at the coronation of Solomon. He says, "Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God." Very same, very same description from Deuteronomy. And here he says, set your heart and your soul. Two different entities to do the same thing. Now, uh, when you set something, it is delivered. When I came in this evening, I was cold, and I went over here to the thermostat, and I bumped it up a couple of things. I set the thermostat. And what happened when I set the thermostat? Well, the furnace kicked on and it got warmer in here. 
You see what I'm saying? How you set something into a, a, a creates an outcome. And so he says again, very simply, set your heart, your personhood, all that you have, you set that on seeking God. Now that can be a very difficult thing because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times, and especially recently, my job has been interfering with my walk with the Lord. Well, I may need to turn the knob a bit. You see what I'm saying? I, need, I may need to switch the settings. You know, uh, uh, used to when uh, I was a kid, it, I'll show you, I can show you, Carlisle, our house literally was built where a hill was cut out. I mean, here the house started, and the, the hill was here, and the house started here, just like that right there. And we had our antenna right between the hill and the house. I don't see how we had enough spots to get in there, but we did. And I remember time and time again, the, we wouldn't get in reception, and of course, I would always have to go and turn the antenna, and Judy would tell me how it was doing Turn it the other way. Turn it the other way. No, no, no. Go back. And everybody, no, no, you younger people know the tribulations of having an antenna that functions that way. But anyway, we were willing to make the adjustments. You see what I'm saying? If it was cold, if it was raining, whatever it was, if Dallas was coming on, we were out there adjusting the antenna to be sure that it was going to be that we'd get a good clear picture. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Then why wouldn't we do that for our relationship with the Lord God Almighty? Switch the settings. Uh, sw switch it around so that He comes first and to the things of this world comes first. Uh, switch it around so that He is the center of it rather than we ourselves being the center of it. We need, to, we need to do a reset. We need to redo these things. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Now, only you can answer if you've done that effectively. But I can tell you the result, if you have done it effectively, you're not going to be too stressed about how other people look at you. You're not going to be too stressed about what other people post on Facebook. You're not going to be too stressed about people's comments about you because you know what? You're set on Christ and what they think about is kind of immaterial, right? Kind of hard to get in that position, isn't it? Well, let me say this. Reset your dial. Uh, adjust it a little bit so that you're in the, the right position before God because when all is said and done what other people does, does it... Uh, <laughs> doesn't have an impact on you spiritually if you reset things. And so uh, the writer uh, at the coronation of the king, his advice to the king was to set himself, to set his soul and his heart on the Lord God Almighty. Uh, go with me uh, to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles this time, uh, chapter 30. Second Chronicles 30, and beginning in verse 15, uh, days of Hezekiah. Uh, Second Chronicles uh, uh, 30, beginning in uh, verse 15. The Bible says, Then they killed the Passover. Now, if you know your Bible, the children of Israel had been in much much uh, spiritual decay. Their nation was also well nationally they were in spiritual decay. Does that sound familiar to you? Uh, the nation of Israel was very unstable economically, unstable, unstable governmentally, and now this has been the result of being in that condition. And finally they began to repent and they want to honor the Lord again by observing uh, by observing the Passover. So 2 Chronicles 30 and, and verse uh, 15, the Bible says, Then they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were shamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. Now I want you to see that they were spiritual enough to be ashamed. Now, I believe we live in a day and age today, do we not, that most people don't even blush anymore. They're not ashamed. 
Now, you know, if you, uh, if you see uh, some ungodly, vile thing, uh, naked people or something, maybe you'll blush, maybe you won't. But what I'm talking about is blushing about your spiritual condition. <clears throat> because, see, you're the only one that knows that. I don't. I know each and, of you, each and every one of you very well. But I do not know you spiritually. Only the Lord God knows right. that. And, you know, sometimes uh, you, can, you can pretend pretty good. You can look like uh, emotionally you're fine. You can look like uh, that the preaching of the Word of God means something to you. When in reality it doesn't. Now, that would be an embarrassment to a true child of God. It would, that's why these uh, that's why these Jewish priests wanted to wanted to clean themselves up, so to speak, and it's because it was embarrassment to them the situation that they were in. Verse 16. And after they stood in their place, and I want you to see that their place, the one that belonged to them, the one that was authored for them, that's where you should be tonight. And they stood in their place after their manner. In other words, they stood, stood in the spot that they were supposed to, and they stood in the manner that they were supposed to. Uh, you know, I didn't know this till I worked with veterans, but there is a specific salute for every unit of our of our military. There's one for the Army, there's one for the Navy, there's one for the Marines, and they're, one, they're all separate and they're all different. And you can tell, when we have an event, you can tell which branch they were in by how they salute. And that is, uh, that's what this is about, getting in your place and doing what yours. Getting in your spot. And whatever he's given you to do, do it. And, and that's what these individuals, that's what uh, these Jewish priests wanted to do in, in their lives. They wanted it to be well. And there were many in the congregation and they, that were not sanctified or set apart or clean. Therefore, uh, the Levites had charge of the killing of the Passovers for every one that was not clean to sanctify the, them unto the Lord. Now, you can read this at home during the rest of the week, but I want you to see that the sacrifice was very specific for those that were there. It was a very particular event. Verse 18, For the multitude of the people were many of Ephraim and Manasseh and Issachar and Zebulun and, and had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover, otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, the, God, the good Lord pardon every one. Now I want you to see that they were violating the Jewish law. And Hezekiah prayed for them. He saw that there was an issue, and Hezekiah didn't run up and jerk the food away from them. He prayed for them. You know, that's where we need to be. I, 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 at least I think I do. Me and Don was talking about this recently. You know, we don't probably know a tenth of what the Word of God teaches. We think we do. But, uh, so certainly when someone's in error, we shouldn't come up there and jerk it away from them. We should pray for them. And that's exactly what Hezekiah's example was. He, he simply prayed for them. Uh, he, he wanted... He wanted them to be right, but he did not jump on them simply because they weren't doing things like, like they felt like, or like he felt like they should be done. Verse 19. Uh, but Hezekiah prayed, uh, verse 18. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, the, the good Lord pardon every one of you that prepareth his heart to seek God. How do you prepare your heart? How do you get that job done? It's a command time and time and time and time and time, and time again in the Scripture. If we want to approach God, there has to be some kind of inward preparation. Now, especially when I was younger, and maybe not so much more these days, but used to when I was a boy on Sunday, you wore the very best that you had. Now, it might not have been that nice, but of what, what you had, it was still the best. And uh, that was preparation. 
Now, I remember my grandmother, mama's mama, killing chicken, frying it up, having everything else ready before she we even walked up the door to the church. That was preparation because she knew it would be done, it had to, it had to be ready when she got back. Uh, that's preparation. Uh, I remember when I was real young and Judy was crazy about dressing and she'd lay it out at night before before we got up ready to go the next day. That was preparation. So if we can do all that to physically meet, what can we do to prepare spiritually? Well, what about how much prayer is involved in that? How much is the book involved in that? How much praying for me is, as your pastor is involved in that? And I believe what we would see, just like they did in the days of Hezekiah, if we would make these preparations and we would make this a prayerful time, that the Lord would bless, that He would give us, He would give us help in our day of need. Now, I have one more place I want to read for you, and we're going to be done in the uh, little book of Hosea. Now, Hosea is an interesting book if you really study it. Uh, it's kind of a, an entire uh, uh, entire book about recovery, about redemption, about being bought back. Hosea 10 and verse 12. So to yourself in righteousness. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, he makes you responsible. So to yourself, S O W, meaning put out some seed, uh, place them in the ground. So to yourself. Now, um, we are to be giving, you know, and we are to be a giving people, and certainly that's right. And uh, I know uh, Sarah Elizabeth could identify with this. When your children are young, it's all consuming job. So to yourself. Uh, my job at work between between my job at work, my young child, my older children, my grandchildren, and pastoring, there's not a lot left. But I better so to myself. Uh, Individually, sowing to yourself is extremely important. Because you know what? If you don't sow to yourself individually spiritual things, you'll dry up very, very soon. You won't have nothing to go on yourself. You, you'll have nothing to feed for yourself. So he says, sow to yourselves. Uh, sow individually. Sow for what's ahead. Sow to yourself in righteousness. So that preparatory work has to be there uh, for that spiritual fruit to come. You have to put it out there and you have to do it in righteousness. You have to do it uh, with a clean heart. You have to, you have to uh, uh, sow it in the right way. Reap in mercy for it is time to seek the Lord. I want to see all the preparatory work. And then he says till he come and rain righteousness upon you. And now, a little bit further down, it tells us this, break up your fallow ground. Now, fallow ground is tillable ground that's not being used. Y'all all know what our place looks like, and we have about five acres on the creek that's very, very useful. And y'all all know that me and Don can't even get a garden out on it. Uh, now, I believe it would be beneficial if we had time. But that's kind of our attitude towards spiritual things, isn't it? If he saved us, we have the ability to produce spiritual fruit. That, that's undeniable. That's why he saved you. And if that being true, and it is true... Every, each and every one of us have extra ground. We have ground that we're simply not using. 
And, you know, we use a thousand different excuses. I've got this going on. I've got that going on. And, and you know, I'm owning years now, blah, 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 blah. Break up your file ground. There's something out there that's not being used. Now, the reason it's so critical, we live in some rough, rough days. And you need something to go on. You need something to sustain you in a day that is becoming harder and harder. So that little patch of land you haven't been using, break it up. Uh, get ready. Uh, Sarah, over at our house, she's got a little compost thing she's doing. And it's probably on the steepest portion of our land, almost. Uh, and I'm interested to see what happens with it. Uh, it wouldn't have been the place I would have picked. You see what I'm saying? But it has to be useful in, does it not? So whatever thing you're not using, clean it up and start using it. And there's something there for every one of us that we can use to give praise and glory and honor to the Lord. And every time that I've attempted this, I've seen the Lord bless me. I've seen Him... Uh, uh, encourage me spiritually, and I think very much uh, he's encouraged others.